Okay, we need to talk. It's about what's on your phone, about what you're doing online. Now, I don't know what you thought I was talking about, but I was referring to how we interact to our online world. I'm talking about social media. That was a close one. This week, we are kicking off a new series called Struggles. Struggles is all about following Jesus in a selfie-centered world. Through this series, we're gonna look at five struggles we face as we look at an online or social media world. Now, I realize that some of you aren't on social media or you don't own a smartphone yet, but even if you do not have a login, social media affects your everyday life. And there is a high likelihood that someday in the future, you will have social media and a phone of your own. Now, before we get started, let me be clear. This is not a series about how social media is the worst thing ever. Personally, I love social media. There are so many benefits. It keeps me very connected to a big world. It makes a big world feel so much smaller. I love that social media gives people a platform to promote businesses and causes. I like how I can see and keep up on the latest news in sports and around the world. But just like anything, even though there are benefits, there are also downsides or negative consequences to such a powerful tool. And we're going to talk about those challenges throughout this series. Today, we are talking about our struggle with contentment. Contentment is feeling like you have enough. The struggle with contentment is within all of us. From a very young age, we are always looking for the next bigger and better thing. Anyone have siblings? I do. I bet if your sibling had something you wanted, you did everything in your power to get that thing from them, or it would absolutely derail your day. It's nothing new. But some experts say that never before has discontentment been a bigger issue. There is no time in history when society as a whole had so much, yet wanted so much more. Here's the thing. Social media drives discontentment. And here's why. Most of the times the things we see online are what I call framed. These are the best images, the best words, the most polished filtered version of life, which is the opposite of everyday life. At least for me, I wake up in the morning kind of looking like this guy. The truth is, what we see online usually isn't reality. It's only an inflated imitator of reality. Social media posts have the appearance of being real, but rarely is what we post the whole story. Think about it. When you post a selfie, you don't post the worst picture out of the five or 10 or 20 you took. You post the best picture. And we all do that. Here's the issue. One of the reasons we struggle with contentment is we compare someone else's online highlight reel to our everyday behind the scenes life. Never before has it been so easy to see what everyone else is up to. It's never been so easy to see what we're missing out on. A party we weren't invited to, 
a hike photo we weren't a part of, a vacation we didn't go on. Never before is it so easy to measure popularity. Followers, comments, likes and shares are all an online scoreboard. The thinking is you have this many followers, this many likes or shares. Therefore, you have this much influence. When I was a kid, the only way to tell if someone was popular was if they got picked first when we played football during lunch. Nowadays, a measure of popularity is what we measure online. You see, social media changes social currency. In other words, social media isn't something we have to interpret. Instead, it's measured by likes, comments, and shares, which is sometimes hard to separate from real life. And so when we compare someone else's highlight reel to our everyday life, we often feel like everyone else's life is better, like we're missing out and our life simply comes up short. Here's the thing, this kind of thinking is a trap. It's a trap. It is. Here's how the trap of comparison works. The more we compare with others, the less satisfied we feel about ourselves. So the more we look at other people and say, what they have, I want, the more we look at what we have as not enough. For instance, we see that our friend Carl, Hey Carl, Carl, has a new hat that we really like. I want that hat. And in that moment, we say, I want a hat just like Carl. My hat is just kind of okay. Or maybe, we feel discontent because we see that our friend Sarah was at the beach for the second time this year, and we haven't been to the beach in years, or maybe ever. We can get caught up in what other people are up to and not even really notice how it affects us. Someone said this once, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond. And that's a great thought, and ideally I hope we live like that. But the reality is, most of us live the opposite. In other words, many of us let our circumstances determine how we live, rather than letting our response to circumstances determine how we live. Today and throughout this series, I wanna look at our Christ-like response to circumstances. Because if we can respond the way that Jesus did, the way that he wants us to respond, we will find strength and confidence. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul was the master of response. Here's a part of one of Paul's letters, and here's the thing. Paul didn't write this from a vacation home or from inside of a palace. He wrote this from a prison, chained to a Roman guard because of his faith in Jesus. He said this, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So Paul was in prison and he said he can do anything, including be in prison for his faith. And still he can be content. How? How does Paul manage to be content even when his circumstances would encourage discontent? Paul said he had a secret. He said, I can do anything and everything through Christ. The secret is not in what I do or do not have. It's found in who I know. In other words, my worth and my purpose is given through Jesus. You know, some people spend their whole life searching for purpose. Many times they look everywhere and sometimes for their whole life. They look at popularity and influence, financial wealth, relationships, yet they don't find purpose. They never find contentment because they spend their time looking for what could give them purpose, and they never look at who gives purpose to everything. This was what Paul was saying. Until we recognize that Jesus is all we have, we'll never recognize that Jesus is all we need. As Paul said, it's through Jesus and only through him that we find contentment in life. So Jesus must be the source of our contentment in every circumstance. This is the foundation and the reason we have hope to rid ourselves of the struggle of feeling discontent in a selfie-centered world. Here are two practical steps for us to keep Jesus the source of our contentment. 
The first step is we must cut out comparison. Now let's talk about comparison for a moment. Remember, comparison is a trap. It's a trap. We may say, I only compare so that I can get better. And that may feel true. And there's nothing wrong with research. But the target God has given us isn't that person at school or online. God's target for us is Jesus. For us to become more like Jesus every day in our own unique way. You see, God has a unique purpose and plan for each of us. When we try to be like other people, we are essentially saying, God, I know who I should be more than you know who I should be. Now, to be clear, are we ever gonna be as good as Jesus? No, but God gives us grace as we try. The Apostle Paul, remember him from earlier? He also wrote this. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Paul knew that when we compare ourselves with someone else, we miss the point. He says it's foolish to compare ourselves to other people. Well, why is it foolish? Because we miss what God is doing in our life when we focus on someone else's. Comparison is not only foolish, but it's dangerous. Look at this. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. When we compare, we let the thoughts of, I don't have enough, or what is owed to me is not mine, become a source of bitterness in our life. And this bitterness and envy steals the joy that God intends for us to have. So how do we cut out comparison? Well, it's been said that what we feed grows and what we starve dies. We need to starve comparison. How do we starve it? We cut the temptation out of our diet. We all have avenues for comparison. Maybe you have a certain person you follow online who really just makes you feel jealous. They have everything you want. Maybe it's time to take a break from that person. Maybe when you walk around the mall socially, you are tempted to always get more. After all, that's what malls are designed to do. So maybe you need to find a new hangout for you and your friends. Maybe when you're bored, you take your phone out and you scroll, scroll, scroll. And when you're done, you just leave wanting to get or be more because of a post. These are good examples of things many people struggle with. But what about you? What are the areas you compare most? Scrolling online, at school, at the mall? Identify the places where you feel the most discontent with what you have. It's important to know the places where you are most tempted so you can put boundaries on certain people or places. Now, there are many areas where we can't avoid comparison, like school or maybe a job. And in those areas, this is where it's so important that we pray, and that we find strength in Jesus. We can pray simple prayers before school like, God, help me to be content with what you provide for me. Help me to see things the way that you see things. Now, I realize that seems simple and maybe a little silly, but if you mean it and pursue it, it's likely your heart will change and you may find yourself less tempted to compare as you cut out comparison. Like Paul said, the secret to being content isn't determined by our circumstances, but by Jesus. So get rid of comparison. The next way we can fight against the struggle of comparison is to cultivate gratitude. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, we become thankful for what we do. This is a matter of perspective. What's your perspective? Here's a good test. I'm gonna put 20 seconds on the clock and I want you to quickly write down five things that you are thankful for. If you struggle to get five, 
Chances are you don't cultivate gratitude regularly. Now, I didn't give a pop quiz to bring on guilt, only to highlight a truth. Gratitude is like a muscle. And just like a muscle, the more you use it, the more it grows. So how can we exercise this muscle of gratitude? Well, we say thank you more often, not just to people, but also to God. Instead of looking at what you have as something that is yours, maybe your perspective needs to shift to God has entrusted me with this thing, this situation or relationship. How will you use it? And do I say thank you for the honor of being entrusted in the first place? Don't forget, as Christians, we have received the greatest gift of all in Jesus. And if you're hearing this and you haven't received the gift of Jesus, that's okay. You can do that anytime, even right now. God gives us blessings through Jesus. Blessings like hope, peace, and contentment in this life. For all Christians, the hope we have in Jesus should inspire a grateful heart. Having a grateful heart is something that happens as we follow Jesus and as we actively pursue him. If you claim that Jesus really did save you, shouldn't that be something to be thankful for every day? Our faith should change not only the way we live, but the attitude we have as we live. Every day we have a choice. Our choice is in our response. So much of the time, our circumstances are out of our control, but our response to those circumstances is our choice. The question is, Will you continue to feed the monster of comparison or will you cut it out? Remember, what you feed grows and what you starve dies. So let's be intentional about what we feed. Our strategy to battling against feeling discontentment is to cut out comparison and to cultivate gratitude. Starve comparison and feed gratitude. Remember, we do not fight alone. God is with us and he is for us. God wants us to be set free from the struggle of contentment in a selfie-centered world. See you next time.